Today we're talking about Prince vs. United States, which, despite being about as popular as this channel, definitely has had more impact on the structure of states' rights than probably half the people who signed the Declaration of Independence. Of course, we're not talking about John Hancock, who I bet would have ridden first if the framers would have let him. Come on, man, you don't just underline your name, you swirled all over it. Even Donald Trump would have probably said, that's a little bit self-indulgent. Now, we're talking more about this guy, whose signature looks like what I do when I have to sign for my card. Um, guys, you want me to sign this document that will make me a criminal in Britain? Well, okay. Alright, so Prince vs. United States. A case that took place in 1996 to determine what power the government has in making sure the states implement federal programs. This is the justification for sanctuary cities as well as the justification recently cited for why states do not have to participate in Obamacare. So let's get a little background. Well, in 1993, this happened. Our critics have said that the Brady Bill is only symbolic. Well, I think there is some symbolism in the Brady Bill. Well, there was something symbolic in the Brady Handgun Control Bill, but not what you're thinking because it was eventually ruled partially unconstitutional by a judge who was later shot to death by a handgun. So what was the Brady Bill? Well, it was an act that said, It's a five day waiting period as I think we all five business days of waiting period if you want to purchase a handgun. And those days are going to be spent checking on who you are and what your record is and all that. What? You have to wait five days to buy a handgun? I can't stay angry that long. Now the specific part of the bill that went to the Supreme Court in this case was the question of whether the federal government can make chief law enforcement officers conduct background checks for weapons purchases. Alright, so let's jump right in. We'll hear argument now, number 95-1478, Jay Prince, the sheriff of Ravalli County, Montana. First, what's the problem? Because oddly enough, the vast majority of this bill was not under question. In fact, the only problem was an interim provision, so treating this case as a gun control case would be like saying you hate the idea of flight because the TSA is terrible. By November of, of 1998, there is to be online the permanent Brady Act provisions under which the federal government will undertake these functions. There will be an instant check where the uh, a, a Federal Bureau of Investigation basically will be conducting these background checks and all of our 10th Amendment problems go away with that. Yes, the Tenth Amendment is in question here. The closing lines of the Bill of Rights, and it is an amendment with more clauses than a Christmas story. The specific clause in question here is the commandeering clause. You know, like... NYPD, I need to commandeer this vehicle. Except, in this case, the cop is the federal government and the vehicle is the state government. Now, this is where things get a bit confusing because this question really led to two separate debates that led this simple problem over whether, in the interim, officers have to run background checks on people trying to buy handguns into a debate on everything, from infrastructure spending to immigration to who controls voter roll data. It went in so many directions so abruptly that if I hadn't been acclimated by a year of Trump speeches, I would have flown off the rails. So let's get started with a simple question. What constitutes a country commandeering a state? Can they just pass a law saying we think it's in the public interest to resolve uh, issues of poverty and we mandate the states to carry out our extensive program that we devise and the states are to manage it. No money, no option. You go do it, states. Or or some health program, or some state highway safety program, same thing. The federal government needs to provide money, and there needs to be an option to not take the money and simply walk away. Now, I imagine some of you just logged into a message board to report that this is why Obamacare is unconstitutional. Congratulations, we finally cracked the code. After a quick Google search, the basic reason I could find is that the Affordable Care Act is acceptable because in 1937's case of Helvering v. Davis, where we created the social security system, we gave the federal government control over health care. Anyways, back to this case. The question was, did this give states options? 
the reason that the reasonable efforts clause is put in there is precisely so that he could choose uh, to carry out his state functions instead. Oh yeah, and brace yourself, because no Supreme Court case is complete without giving up over trying to define an ill-defined term. And today's term is... Reasonable effort. In this Brady Bill, it said a law enforcement officer needed to exert reasonable effort in doing these background checks. But reasonable effort is very much in the eyes of the beholder, because for some people, it's getting a 600 on the SAT, while for others, it's finding the right room. Do you, do you think it would be open to a court, to this court, to construe that reasonable effort criterion as one uh, which turns on the law enforcement officer's own view of what in relation to all of his other responsibilities and in relation to his resources is reasonable? Can he be the judge of reasonableness? To some extent, perhaps, because it, the language is there, but I, I think that there's a, a, a vanishing point or an ending point. If he doesn't do any, uh, makes no effort whatever to conduct these background checks and, and to make these legal determinations, it seems that he is not making a reasonable effort. So the question became, is saying an officer needs to put in reasonable effort when completing a background check, giving the state options? Well, some would say that this is like your girlfriend telling you to just try and like this obscure French film, an effort that lasts until the first scene is ten cuts of someone crying for a minute. Hey, I made an effort. So that the local law enforcement officer He's got a real policy choice, number one, in, in choosing between his Brady Act responsibilities and whatever other local law enforcement abilities he's got. And number two, uh, I, I suppose even independently of that, he's at least got an initial policy choice to make about how intrusive an investigation is reasonable enough. The other side responded to this, saying that it really isn't an option, because whether you're making an effort to like it or not, you're still watching the French film. Just because it's black and white doesn't make it good. This argument was made by Justice Scalia. Well, that policy choices are left for the local government. They, the local government does not have to decide whether A, to raise taxes, or B, to divert police officers from hunting murderers and rapists to looking up these records, or three, I don't know what, to declare bankruptcy. Uh, aren't these all unpleasant policy choices that the, that the government has imposed upon, uh, upon the localities? So now a part of the state government has to divert some attention away from other tasks to deal with making sure we don't sell handguns to criminals and other people it's illegal to sell handguns to. And all because the White House wants to only arm people who can legally carry guns. Unfortunately, because it's a system that states do not have the opportunity to opt out of, even if officers acted like Mark Zuckerberg and treated the background checks like... You have part of my attention, you have the minimum amount. The rest of my attention is back at the office. They would still have to divert a legally recognizable minimum effort into conducting background checks, because the federal government said so, without offering an opt-out option. Furthermore, this is really a problem of principle over practice because... And even if 10 minutes a month required by the officer, if the federal government orders it, you can't do it. I, I don't if know what... 10 minutes a month or 10 minutes a year, that's your position. That's our position, absolutely. Although this was the mid-1990s, a time when most people tried to avoid computers at all cost. For all you youngins, using a computer back then was like listening to Skrillex if he was a sadist. Oh, I have to look up this guy in the database? Wait, someone calling? No! Goodbye. Yeah, no one's nostalgic for that part of the 90s. Anyways, the point here is, it's not about how much of an imposition a government program is. The problem lies with the fact that the state is being forced to do it. Just a quick side note before we move on, a brief exchange between the conservative arguing against forcing officers to conduct background checks and a justice led to the ultra-influential piece of precedence. Congress, under Article 1, Section 8, is empowered to enact a uniform rule of naturalization. And we interpret those early naturalization statutes as being under that provision and then being applied uh, through the state judiciary through Article 6. Okay, I think we all know where this one's headed. 
But it's crazy in a modern context to hear a conservative cavalierly state what he's advocating for would include... We don't think that under the uniform rule of naturalization that Congress could compel a state sheriff uh, to make background checks of aliens, do you? Absolutely not, because the, the sheriff is not a state judge, and Article 6 refers explicitly to state judges. Wow, yeah, those two lines mean a lot more now than they did back then. So, undocumented immigrants? Remember to thank your local anti-gun control lobbyist for giving you some rights. And hey, now you can probably buy a gun too because of them. Now, the other point here is, because this is a capitalist society, if you want to get the states to do anything, show me the money. Well, my question is, are you saying that there's nothing like this? That in every case there's either something explicit in, in the Constitution, like the obligation of the courts that you get from Article 6, or extradition. Is this the first of a kind, or is there anything that you would concede is like it? You know when a justice asks you if there's ever been a case like this before, or if it's the first of its kind, it's kind of like a parent asking if your teacher really wrote her that letter saying that you need to play more video games because you need to improve your eye-hand coordination. Now. His response was interesting and brings us to a landmark case we'll touch on, New York versus United States. I think there, there may be some of these laws, for example, I believe there's one cited here about uh, underground storage facilities where the states are supposed to inventory and report underground storage facilities. And frankly, Your Honor, I was not able to find a specific item in that statute that related to the spending power. It's just one of those obscure laws that, that I'm not really sure what the, the basis of it is. But, but in terms of precedence for this law that we have here, I think the, uh, the, the law in New York versus United States was one that uh, was on all fours with the law here. So the U.S. managed to sneak in a few small unconstitutional state regulations like the ability to be notified of all underground storage centers. Which seems odd, because I'm betting that the people who create underground storage centers aren't exactly thrilled about reporting their existence and location to the federal government without a compensation program. That said, let's take a second to look at New York versus United States. This case revolved around nuclear waste storage, the number one producer of superheroes. You see, in the 1980s, while Manhattan might have been bright, other parts of New York State were literally glowing, because it was producing a ton of nuclear waste with no clear strategy for dumping, which is as bad as it sounds. At the time, there were only three dumping sites in the United States, and the federal government wanted to change that, so they used a three-pronged approach, of which two are relevant to the plaintiff's argument that this is unconstitutional. First, a monetary incentive would be available to states that entered regional agreements or opened in-state disposal sites. This is the way the plaintiff thinks that the federal intervention should be done and was found constitutional by the Supreme Court because Congress can legally provide incentives to states to accept government programs to their spending powers, as long as you can say no. Now, the third provision set off more alarm bells than hitting the jackpot at a slot machine. Third, a take title provision would require states that did not provide for waste disposal to take ownership of the waste and accept responsibility for any liability that the waste caused. Essentially, if your state creates a toxic byproduct, you have to take responsibility for it. Now, I hear most of you saying, that sounds pretty reasonable, but states' rights, baby! It was said that the federal government was commandeering the state government by forcing state governments into the service of federal regulatory purposes, and instead, it was said it had to remain the problem of the federal government. To which South Dakota looked at the recent 210,000 gallon oil spill and sighed relief and told Trump, put it on our tab. So back to the case, because there was one revealing exchange that might have led to a compromise. Wouldn't they go away as well if the government offered money to chief law enforcement officers to administer the program and you would have an option whether to accept the money and administer it or not? As long as the option was there. Uh, you wouldn't be here. We would not be here, absolutely not. But there was no money and there was no option. So there you go, that's the constitutional way of doing it. Provide money and an option to change a state's behavior. 
Only problem? Justice Stevens quickly emphasized that this emphasis on states' rights was actually creating an enormously powerful federal government. Now, this might sound weird at first, but... Where is it in our history, or our constitution, or in the language, that it is more respectful of states to have a nationwide computer system run by the FBI than to impose minor reporting requirements on state officials. Think about it this way. Essentially what happened was that states yelled out, you can't make us do background checks on gun sales. If you want that to happen, you're going to have to do it yourself. To which the federal government said, okay, and gained the power to directly perform background checks through the FBI. Wow, people high-fived themselves and cheered over states' rights. So now, there is one hugely important aspect to this case that just came out of right field. Whether states have to share data with the federal government. Now, just listen to how the court reacts. A federal agent can come and look at state records would be allowed. I mean, that's, that's a remarkable difference in that's, position. That's a hypothetical question. That, that issue hasn't been briefed here. No, if your if position, we solve the counsel, citation to the authority for that. Your position, counsel, has been that there's a lack of power here. Yes, Your Honor. That is as close as you're going to get to pandemonium in the Supreme Court. So all of a sudden, there was a new argument that said that state governments would not be required to hand over state data to the federal government. Because... Supposing they amended the statute to say that all investigations shall be done by federal employees, FBI agents or something, but that the uh, chief law enforcement officer of each community must make available to the federal officer any records that will help them find out this information. Would that be constitutional? No, Your Honor. This is an incredibly prescient issue because, again, the court got into debating details that were so related to future controversies, I'm not totally convinced that Justice Rehnquist isn't some kind of gypsy. Even if the federal government were to send out people to look at state records, that, that would not be permissible. And I, 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 th I think that's a rather strange answer, if I understood it correctly. Certainly, in, say, in voting rights cases, and then fed federal uh, FBI people come and look at state voter registrations, if no activity were required on any part of state agents. Well, now that specific issue won't turn out to be a problem. Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe told CBS News his state will not hand over sensitive voter files to the White House. McAuliffe joins officials from more than 20 states who say they can't or won't comply with this week's request for voter roll data. So that's the case. Now to the results. Unfortunately, I could only find one source talking about the results of this case, and that was InfoWars. So yeah, I think I'm going to handle this one on my own. The main legacy of this bill, as you can imagine, was in its legal legacy of making it so that the federal government cannot force state governments to do anything and the state governments cannot be forced to hand over information. The impact on the Brady Bill was negligible, as the interim provision became voluntary and almost every officer volunteered. And after the interim, the FBI took over the background checks using their own database of information. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating the Supreme Court, subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly Supreme Court Saturday episodes. And remember to subscribe and leave me a comment if you have an important case you think I should research. Also, please share this so that if anyone is looking for more information on this case, they can get it from me rather than... I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay!